morning and a welcome to each one here this morning. I'd like for you to turn to Matthew 25. And I think we'll read 14 through 20 of Matthew 25. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had, fi- that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh, and reckoneth with them, And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, Thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and I went... And hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I have sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the, the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. First and foremost, we see that God has a purpose for all of us. Um, what is that purpose? Ultimately, I think he's, what he's trying to say here, he's, he wants all of us to add value to his kingdom. Um, and God has given us talents. i like for, for us to talk about that a little bit. What, what has he given us? What has he given you? Opportunities? Godly families? The ability to speak, responsibilities, wisdom, what was that, caring, the ability to receive and to give love. Those were, I had down um, time. He's giving us time to add value to his kingdom. He's given us opportunities. He's given us resources. Um, and he, it's natural gifts as well. Some of us um, are good at this. Some of us are good at that. And he often puts us in positions um, that even stretch that farther and... Um, allows us to use those gifts. Positions in the church. Um, It might be influence, and that can be in your families, it can be in your friend group, it can be in the church, um, in your community. And and this kind of came to me later on in the message, um, this passage here, or later on in my studies. And as I was thinking about this, are we at Cornerstone only maintaining what God has given us. He's given us something, 
and we just say, you know what, I, I just want to, sometimes we get caught up in the thing of we just maintain and we don't take risks for the kingdom of God and we don't, um, not adding value to his kingdom. I'd like for us to think about that as, as we go on through the message this morning. Um, I noticed there's some other families or children that aren't here, and my the twins are sick this morning. And um, I asked Lane, I said, why don't you just go, and um, won't you preach this morning? And uh, he looked at me, and he's like, Dad, I can't do that. And that's kind of how I feel this morning in, in the message as well, because it's not something I have done well in. Um, the thing I would like to, to share about um, is something I want to do better in. And uh, so that's my challenge this morning. This message was inspired in part um, by our Sunday school lesson um, and also because of a conversation I had this past week. And in mulling over the Sunday school lesson um, the past couple weeks where it seems like the conversations that Jesus, that we see that Jesus had with people, the, the opportunities or the, the ways that he found ways to teach people and to, to bring it to us as well. Um, but some of the conversations that he had with the re- religious leaders, the Pharisees, the, uh, the scholars of their day, um, and it seems like he gets into situations where they're at odds with each other and um, and as we look through that the position or the standing that the Pharisees or the religious leaders had taken Jesus was saying you're missing it you're, you're totally missing what I'm trying to tell you um, in all of this you, you don't even understand who who God is, and what he's trying to do through me for the people. Um, And I think his heart is, he's he's saying, there's so much more that you could experience that you're not experiencing. Um, There's no fulfillment in what you're doing. And um, I think he was saying, I'm here to show you the heart of God, and, and you're not accepting me, and in that, you're missing the blessings of what God has for you. The conversation I had was Friday night here in the back. Um, I was speaking with Conrad, and um, we started a conversation on family and um, just kind of what what drew them to start this ministry. Um, so anyway, he went on to describe that their family obviously they were given the opportunity to do this that was one thing um but he said it was a combination of things he said somebody had encouraged them to do something like this he said it doesn't have to be through this ministry it can be through any ministry ministry but i encourage you to do something so he said that was one thing but he said he's had a conversation (coughs) with his children and it was a conversation that resonated with me because it's a conversation i've had with my children as well, maybe on a younger version, but he said he asked his youth the question, who in your circle of influence is encouraging you or pushing you to be like that tree planted by the river? Or or who in your circle is that tree? And um, I've kind of had that conversation with, with my girls as well and just Who's the positive influence in your circle of friends? And and encouraging them to be that, um, to be that positive influence. Be the one that says, hey, there's a better way. Be the one that says, there's a better situation that we can, we can, uh, we can do better in this. Be that positive influence. And he said, so that was a big part um, of it. And he, and he also said, um, 
that one of the things that he wanted was more for his family. And um, he said that he wanted his children, he, he wanted to feel from his children that they had a heart for ministry. And he said he wasn't willing to do that until he sensed that from his children. And they had, they had started a, uh, a tour last fall just kind of as a tryout to see how it would go. And um, he wanted them to be willing to speak for what Jesus has done in their life and, and what he's working in their life. Um, and he said he wanted their commitment before something like that. And he also said what Junior said. Um, he said this is their 27th program. And he said from observation, he said, I've noticed something about churches. And he said some of the programs that they've given, he said the just the emptiness in people's eyes and and the staring at the wall, he said, versus some of the programs that they've given in prison, he said sometimes he has felt for the people in church that they're more in bonds than the people in bonds in prison who are free. And um, and he also mentioned, um, he said, I saw life here. And he said, I, I want to encourage you in that. And I thought about that too, Junior. Maybe he saw it in the other people. Maybe he didn't see it in our church. But it was an encouragement to me because sometimes I have been there where it's like, where's the life? And um, that starts from within. And, and I encourage all of us to um, want something more in, in our lives. What does that look like? What do we have to offer? We're here in Cornerstone. We're here in Harrison. What do we have to offer the community around us? Um, <coughs> and it starts right here. And something I would love to see more of is just a, a willingness to share or a willingness to speak for what Jesus did. I think it was Brad that came forward and he said, who all has been blessed this morning? And I saw hands go up. Let's say that. And it doesn't have to be about the message. But say, are you sitting through church and not being blessed or not being challenged? Um, and that starts here. And I think being prepared for that, it can be the song service. It can be the devotional. It can be the Sunday school. It can be the little boy that's holding the door open for you. Um, but something like, like, what is inspiring you? And if you can't say what's inspiring you here, how are you going to say it there? And um, that's, that's kind of the, the point of my message. What do you have to offer? And I encourage you to start it right here. I'd like to turn to uh, the Gospel of Luke in chapter 15. My goal for the message this morning is to stir our hearts and minds and not only challenge, but also equip us to be willing to be actively involved in reaching people who are not living in a right relationship with God. Sharing the good news. What is the good news? What is it? Jesus died and saved us from our sins. I think that has to be first and foremost. What is the good news? Like, what did he offer me? If I don't know what he offered me, how am I going to offer that to someone else? Um, Jesus came in the world to offer the opportunity to experience the forgiveness of sin and a relationship with God. Many people have no hope, and we can bring that hope to those people but we first have to experience it in our life and understand what it is. Um, and if there's one key thing that I want you to hear over and over is that evangelism is something that should happen at least on some level in all of our lives. Um, whether it's through the person we just met but in our relationships, evangelism is something that should happen, at least on some level, in all of our lives. First Thessalonians 2, verse 8, in my own words, 
Paul saying, We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. And Paul is writing these words, and he's reminding the people there that we didn't just bring the gospel. We didn't just bring words. We didn't just bring writings. It wasn't a track that they just handed out. They brought their lives as well. And they were able to receive the gospel through real life, flesh and blood relationships. And he says, we loved you so much that we were delighted to not only show you the gospel, but our lives as well. It was the spiritual influence. It was more than writing. They were able to respond or they were able to see how they responded when people hurt them. They were able to see how they responded when things didn't go well, when people took advantage of them. Um, you could say they put their lives out there as a demo as such. They were able to see it in everyday life. And that is how spiritual influence or evangelism works in our world today. It's, it's how it works best. We can say what we want to say, but unless our lives show what we're really trying to say, nobody, it, it, it bounces off the wall. It's not something you have to take a class in. You don't have to go to Bible school. Um, you don't have to take a, or be an intern. Um, it's something all of us can do on some level. We just have to be willing to be involved at some level. The main thing is you have to care enough about lost people and that's the thing that I struggle in is just understanding that the heart of God and how he feels about lost people. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God but our lives as well. Hold on to that. The important question for all of us is, do we really care about lost people? Are they even on our radar? There's no doubt that God cares about lost people. Do we share God's heart for lost people? Do we even understand or know what God's heart is for lost people? And if we understand that one of the reasons Jesus came to earth was to reveal the reality of who God is. We know the primary reason was for him to, to come, to give his life, to pay the penalty for our sins, and to satisfy God's need for justice for your sin and for mine. We know that, but the Bible also says he came to seek and to save that which was lost, and so he focused, his focus was on people that the Pharisees or the, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, had no time for. And, and it, was, it was a strange thing for them to, to grasp that or get their hands around, why would God or why would Jesus care so much about people who can give him nothing in return or, or, or who care very little about him? Um, and there's a lot of places in the, in the New Testament that, that show us that picture clearly. Um, Hebrews 1 verse 3, and I like the way it reads in the NIV, and this is what it says about Jesus, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. The Son, Jesus, is the radiance, and the Greek word that radiance stems from would mean shining, shining light. Um, so if we could picture that Jesus is shining the light on God's glory or the reality of who God is. And that, that's what he's trying to, to uh, tell us. Shines a light on the reality of who God is and the exact representation of his being. So that's not like Carter, where when you go into town with your dad and people say, Oh, Carter, you look right like your dad. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying it's an exact representation. I like to think of, um, you've probably seen these stamps where you put them in hot wax and you have the exact representation of the stamp. Um, 
and leaves it, it leaves an imprint of the exact representation. And that's what the Hebrew writer here is telling us, um, that Jesus came to show the world the heart of the Father and what God is like and um, his heart for lost people. In Luke 15, there are three simple stories here. Um, but before we go into that, one thing um, I'd like to say is until we come to a place where we can share the heart of God for lost people, we're not going to be effective in any kind of evangelism or any kind of outreach work or any kind of spiritual influence until we find or until we come to the place where we share the heart of God for lost people, or at least in some part. And this is how Luke 15 begins. I think we will look at verse 1 and 2. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Here we see he's among two categories of people. Um, you have the tax collectors, and then you have the sinners. Um, and then you have religious people. You have the, the Pharisees or the teachers of the law of that day. And... Jesus finds himself in two different categories of people. The tax collectors were Jewish citizens that had partnered with the Romans um, to collect taxes from their, their fellow Jews, um, and often they collected more than what they had owed. And they were protected um, by that under the Roman government. And so they became hated and were considered traitors because of that. They, they were not liked people. Then we have the, in quote, sinners. Um, and we could describe these people as, as non-religious Jews. Um, people who had no time for God. People who were, who were of the Jewish um, descendants or people who were Jews but had decided that they we're not going to have anything to do with that Jewish heritage. They had turned their back on their Jewish heritage. And then you have another group of people, the scholars of the day. Um, they viewed their job as, gu as guarding the boundaries of who was right and who was wrong, who was in and who was out, and why. And um, we see a lot of tension between them and Jesus in just the fact of they had... They had formed a line, and uh, they had made a decision in their mind why and who was in, who was out. And so Luke 15 starts out with these, these people in the same place, and these religious leaders were murmuring. They were stirred up already um, because Jesus, it says in verse 2, was eating with them, um, talking about the, the tax collector's and sinners, which in their day was basically a sign that he's accepting, he's accepting of these people. Um, and so Jesus takes this opportunity to, to teach them a lesson, or at least try to teach them a lesson, and um, he goes on to say in verse 3, this is the first part of the first story, verse 3 through 7, and he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you like li that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over the ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. So you have a man here with a hundred sheep, a flock of a hundred sheep, and in their day, this would have been a very wealthy man. So he's doing inventory of his sheep and finds out that he's missing one. And instead of saying, you know what, 1% loss, it's not that big of a deal. He counts his loss and he goes home. It's not what happens. He's not satisfied with less than 100%. So it says he... He leaves the, the 99, he pens them up, and he goes out and he's looking for the sheep because he knows that sheep have a tendency to wander 
just like God knows that we, as humans, have a tendency to wander. And when he finds that sheep, he assumes the personal burden of that sheep, and he carries that sheep home. And when he gets home, he says he calls the entire village together to celebrate the fact that this sheep that was lost is and has wandered away, or it wandered away and got lost, has been found. Verse 7 says, And I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. She's saying that's what happens in heaven. Um, when one person who is walking away from God turns and repents and says, God, I need you. So just to make sure we understand the story, the, the shepherd represents Jesus. Um, the shepherd is not your dad. It's not your pastor. It's not some person of influence. The shepherd is Jesus, and he's showing us what God is like. The lost sheep represent lost people. And then the, the friends and neighbors represent all of us believers who celebrate when one sheep is returned. And the message of this story is pretty simple. It's Jesus is calling us, he's inviting us to understand what God feels or what God's heart is for lost people and how he views them. How do you view the lost people? With indifference? With fear? Enemies of your values? Bad influences on your children? People to be avoided? How do you view them? Jesus sees them as sheep that have wandered, lost their way, and people who belong to the Him because He created them to be in fellowship with Him. And the story is simply saying He's not willing in all the others that He has to lose just one. And He wants the opportunity for all of us. No wonder where they've wandered, no matter how long they've been gone, no matter what they've done, he sees them as sheep that can be found and returned home. And he is also willing to bear the weight of sheep, of the sheep, on his shoulders and bring them home. And that's what Jesus did when he came to earth. He took the weight of your sin and mine, literally, and um, took it upon his shoulders. So let me repeat the question. How do you see lost people? The second story is in verse 8 through 10. Either what woman, ha woman having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she called she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in heaven. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And it's also a pretty simple story. And uh, it's very similar, except the main character of the story is a lady. Um, she has ten coins. And I assume this is her life savings. And it's all that she has. And here she has 10 coins. Now she has nine. That's a 10% loss versus a 1% loss. Um, but it's, it's a picture of somebody saying, I'm not giving up until I find it. She sweeps the house. She turns on the light. I won't give up until I find it. And... Once she finds it, she's so excited about it, she calls all her friends, and she tells them about it, and they come over, and they're rejoicing over this lost coin. Um, and I think the main lesson of the story here is Jesus is inviting us again to see the value of lost people. And um, he's telling us 
that they are valuable enough to deserve our all-out effort, um, our highest priority, nothing more important in the moment. Think about this statement. The passion with which we search for something demonstrates how much we value the object. The passion with which we search for something demonstrates how much we value the object. Have you ever lost something? Yesterday, um, there was a fundraiser, a softball tournament fundraiser, and somebody asked me last minute, hey, would I play in that? I said, sure, I'll play. And um, I was about ready to leave, and I couldn't find my shoes, couldn't find my ball shoes. And there was a little sense of, like, panic, like, where did I put them? Did I leave them on the ball field the last place I played? Where did I put it? That's not really what he's talking about here, but we have all been there on a bigger level where we've lost something really, really important, and there's not a moment that goes by. Oftentimes for me, it's not like I'm a disorganized person, but oftentimes it's, it's right when I really need it and I'm, I'm about to leave, you know. And there's not a moment that goes by that you don't sense some kind of panic in that situation. I think that's what he's calling us here is that lost people are valuable and they deserve our utmost attention. Are we willing to sweep the house? Are we willing to turn on the light, willing to do whatever it takes to find that lost person? What do you think our church would be like if all of us dedicated every day of our life, at least on some level, to be searching for lost people because we know they are valuable to God. Imagine what we could be like. And, and as I was studying for this message, I, I just I was thinking, what do I spend my time on? Like, th this so many times is is the farthest thing from me. And and I'm I'm not saying that we stop everything we do and we go out into town and we just start knocking on doors, but when the opportunity arises and that person is in front of you, are you willing to say, "You know what? What I have to do today can wait for another day." And we take that opportunity um to share the third story is in verse 11 and he said a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father father give me the portion of goods that falleth to me and he divided unto them his living and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey unto a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living and, we, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty family in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field. As he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants, and asked what these things mean. And he said unto them, Unto him, My brother, thy brother, is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandment. 
and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fat calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Notice the progression again. Jesus starts out with 100 sheep. He goes to 10 coins, and now he's talking about two sons. Um, and in the ancient world, I did a little bit of study in this. In the ancient world, what this son did was equivalent to him going to his dad and saying, Dad, in essence, I wish you were just dead. And um, there was a Middle Eastern Bible scholar. His name was Kenneth Bailey. He asked a bunch of tribes across the world, what would happen in your setting if a son did this? And in every case, or at least almost in every case, their answer was he would have been beaten and banished. That's it. But yet we see the heart of the father here, and he gives his son the request, and, and we know the story. The son takes the money, and he wastes it. He blows it on partying, on drunkenness, on wild living. Anyway, one day he wakes up, and he... Is broke, alone, hungry, and he partners himself, or he works for, he goes to work for a guy feeding pigs, and says that he was hurting these pigs, and he's so hungry, or hung over, one or the other, that the food that the pigs are eating looked good to him, and I've fed pigs in my life, and none of the food looked good <laughs> that they ate. But he gets to that point in life, and, he, and that's, that's at a point where the picture I get is, like, he has nothing. I mean, when, when you're at the place of, I would eat pig food, that's the bottom. And he comes to himself, and he says, you know what? The servants at my father's house are better off than I am. They have plenty to eat and some to spare. And um, so he decides to go to his dad, and he's, his story was, or he, what he had decided to say was, I've sinned against you and against heaven, and I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. I'm willing to be a hired servant. Um, but as we see in the story, he's not prepared for what he, what, what he experiences when he comes home. Um, his father comes running, his father welcomes him. His father falls on his neck, it says, or falls down and kisses him. Um, as we go on, the older brother, he comes home from work, and he sees what's going on. And he's furious at what happens here that, um, yeah, he's just furious. And he re flat out refuses to go in and be part of the celebration of welcoming his brother home. Verse 28 through 32, the dad leaves the party and goes out to his older son and, and explains the situation of, um, yeah, what's going on here. And the story ends like that. The younger son inside being celebrated, the older son outside angry um, about what's going on. Here's what we see clearly in the story. The father obviously le represents um, Jesus or God. But there's something that we don't immediately recognize in this context. Um, and I know this is a, a parable that Jesus told, but in the setting that they were in for the father to run out and to welcome his son the way he did was just as scandalous as what the son did in their setting. Um, just a scandalous. And I believe that in their setting, or I, I would think, they understood this. Like, they, they, they knew what Jesus was saying. Um, and I think this had a lot to do with just why the religious leaders viewed Jesus as scandalous as well. That he was... Um, that he shared this story because 
in their day, in their day, this was something you just don't do. You, you would not do that as a father. Um, the older son represents, obviously, the religious leaders of the day, but could it be that sometimes he represents you and me in, in just the fact of, God, why can't you be satisfied with what I've done? I've been faithful. I've done everything you've asked me to do. Why can't you just be satisfied with that? Um, but Jesus is inviting us to see lost people as family members who have run away from home. I have an uncle that um, I grew up as a little boy. We'd go over to Grandma's house, and we'd go over there a lot Sunday afternoons, and um, he was older. And, and I, I look back on my, on my childhood. He was, he was a single um, uncle, at, and um, we had a lot of fun. He uh, he would we, we'd go horse riding, and I remember times where he would he would take us camping, him and some of the other uncles take us camping and um, go horse riding. We 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 spent a lot of time in their home. Anyway, one day he leaves, and he was upset about something, and and he leaves and cuts the family totally off. Nobody knows where he's at. Has no idea. And one day, he, uh, I, I think it was for a family reunion, he shows up. Obviously, somebody had, had found contact with him, shows up. And there was kind of a sense of, I'd like to do this more, kind of the feeling we got from him. And he leaves, and he changes his phone number, and you don't hear from him. And later on, a couple years later, his brother died. One of my other uncles passed away. And I think that time they, they had to get, they, they kind of knew that where he was at, in the county he was at, so they got the, uh, the sheriff involved, and, and they found him. And um, he came to the funeral, but I haven't seen him since then. And who knows where he's at? I, if he died, would we find out? Maybe, maybe not. You, you, we don't know. I want you to think for a minute, think about your family, and I want to ask you a question. Who in your family would you be okay with leaving and never coming home? Anybody? That's how God feels about lost people. Back to the story. In real life, the father would have never seen the son. Uh, I think in their day, he would have, the son would have been put out. He would have come into the city or, or whatever, and he would have been put out on the outside of the gate, and he would have been made to sit there. Um, oftentimes, they were beaten. They were spit on. They were just abused. Um, and it was kind of their punishment for destroying the father's or the family's reputation and uh, the community, really. And, yeah, he would have been in the eyes of everybody as a scorn or disgrace to, um, for what he had done to dishonor the family in this way. And if the father ever would receive him back, what I found was the son would have had to humble himself and kneel down and kiss the father's feet. And at that point, the father would say, you're basically a slave for a certain period of time until you repay basically what you have cost my reputation. And, um, but that's not what we see in this story. And, um, I'd like for us to think about this and the Father and what God's heart, what Jesus' heart is in all of this, in lost people, um, in running to lost people and saying, this is my son who was lost and now is found. He was dead and is alive, and that's how God sees lost people. My question is, how do we see lost people? That is all I have, and it's been a challenge for me to study 
this message because it's not something I have done well in, in, in viewing lost people the way God views them. Oftentimes I see it as it's their choice, and it is their choice. But if I see it as a family member that has left home and isn't coming back, or if I see it as um, sheep that have a tendency to wander, and, and we as people have a tendency to wander as well, and look at it as it is of utmost importance, and, and lost people are, uh, are of value to God, and to do what we can to um, bring value to God's kingdom. That's all I have. Let's uh, bow, our word, bow our heads for prayer. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your goodness to us. And I thank you for placing us in the Harrison community. God, as you bring opportunities into our life, as, lo- as you bring people into our lives, the relationships that we are in, help us to have a heart for people, have a heart for lost people, and to, to view them as sheep that have wandered away. Father, help us to be willing to stop what we're doing and to put off what can wait for tomorrow, to be ready and willing to do everything we can to add value to your kingdom and to be that, in, that spiritual influence in somebody else's life. Father, we thank you for all you've done for us. I praise your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.